It's, uh, it's so far been an interesting winter for our baseball team, and it's been interesting because of the lack of doing anything. Um, the winter meetings are, are coming to a close, and that's at a time when most of the trades that uh, are consummated uh, have either been finalized there or were talked about prior to going into the winter meetings, and then they're finally. I don't think this club can in any way go into spring training uh, with the same, basically the same cast of characters that it has and expect to be a, a serious player with people like St. Louis and Milwaukee and Pittsburgh, and I hate to say it, but yes, the Chicago Cubs. Uh, they, they've been unbelievable in the offseason, and now people are talking about possibly being contenders, and I don't know that there's anybody in this room old enough to remember the last time that word was attached to the Chicago Cubs. I know I can go back to when I came in, in the early 70s and and what happened in 75 and 76 with the Big Red Machine team, uh, arguably the greatest team, uh, the greatest coming together of baseball talent in the history of the game. Uh, and even in years when this club did not win, more often than not, they hit a lot of home runs and drove in a lot of runs. You go back to the 50s when uh, my former partner, who was a very important part of that team's rotation, and they had people like Ted Klazuski and Wally Post and Gus Bell and Frank Robinson, uh, great offensive club. Those teams didn't have pitching. Ironically, here we are, and we are loaded with starting pitching. Uh, and this organization has been noted for a lot of things in, in the history of this franchise, but pitching ain't been one of them. Uh, but a great rotation, a bullpen that had some problems last year, which they can correct relatively inexpensively. But I think that when uh, push comes to tug and spring training begins in Arizona in, in February, that uh, this club will have a left fielder that will fill the need that they feel like he has to fill, and probably it will come at the expense of trading one of our starting pitchers. I was informed this morning, and I didn't even know about it, uh, that the rumor now is that Matt Latos is going to the Miami Marlins. Uh, that appears to be a very hot deal. It, it, this club's going to have to give up something, and we really don't have a whole lot else to give up. Uh, that is players that we would be willing to trade other than pitchers. I've said since the season ended that there were only three untouchables on this ball club for me. And they would be Billy Hamilton, the center fielder, they'd be Devin Mesoraco, the catcher, and they'd be Todd Frazier, the third baseman. I'd trade Cueto, I'd trade Chapman, I'd trade anybody else on this ball club in order to improve it. I, I was really disappointed yesterday when the announcement came out of San Diego that. Uh, Dick Enberg had won the Ford Frick Award for 2014 and, uh, and, and not Joe. I thought Joe had a shot. Um, of all the things that have occurred in my career, uh, the Hall of Fame and everything else, they all pale besides the fact that Joe and I were together for 31 years as a broadcast team. That's the longest of any two-man tandem in the history of Major League Baseball broadcasting. Jack Buck and and Mike Shannon were together for 30 years, Joe and I were together for 31. Uh, Joe was the most naive person who I have ever been in contact with in my life. Uh, it is uh, roughly 15 minutes after 12 in the afternoon. If he were here today, give me five minutes and I could convince him it was 12, 15, midnight. <laughs> Joe was an easy mark. And I'll tell you a couple of stories. Um, we uh, had an engineer in uh, San Francisco named Mark, Mike Marquardt, and he used to play all kinds of jokes on Joe. And so one day, he gets in the ballpark early, and, and in each broadcast booth, uh, there is a, uh, there's a little speaker up in the corner of the booth, and that speaker is for the benefit of the official score. And so this particular day, he went down to the main press box and got this guy to uh, voice on an old cassette tape recorder, Joe Nuxall, long distance call for Joe Nuxall on the main press box. And in the bottom of the first inning, this thing comes up. Joe Nuxall, long distance phone call for Joe Nuxall on the main press box. He gets up, he goes down to the press box. He comes back, and we were in a commercial trip. And he said, I got down there, and I asked where the phone was for that long distance phone call. They looked at me like I had two heads. <laughs> he went down there five times. <laughs> and the fifth time he went down there, he went down there to kill somebody. <laughs> he, he was, uh, he, 
he was just an amazing human being. He was, he was, a, he was a man who, uh, the only person I've ever known who was totally, completely without any ego at all. He had none. And he was so loved by people in Cincinnati and what we refer to as Red's country. Uh, in all the years that he and I worked together, I've never heard one person ever utter a negative about him. Not one time. I mean, that's, you think about that now. I mean, uh, they talk about Pete Rose and Oscar Robertson and people like that being the greatest sports icon in the history of the city of Cincinnati. They don't hold a candy to joke. Not a candy. Because I'm going into my 42nd year uh, when the time comes to walk away from it, I'll be a, one of a handful, and this makes, I'm proud of this too, that spent 40 years or more broadcasting big league baseball and did it with all, did it with only one team. Uh, and so I, you know, I don't know how long I'm, how much longer I'm going to work. Uh, I still enjoy it. I still feel like I do a decent job. Uh, and it's nice to appear before people who are fans uh, and, and are interested in knowing about the team that, uh, that I work for, whether it's a good team or whether it's a bad team. I love to talk baseball and love to talk about the Cincinnati Reds.